Americans often view the modern Middle East as a crucible of ancient religious feuds and oppressive dictators. In recent years, our leaders have insisted that the apparent cure for these deficiencies was military invasion, armed U.S. occupation, and the American-directed reformulation of the countries of the Middle East, starting with Iraq. But no one really asked the people of the region what they wanted or desired, nor what their history revealed about foreign interventions. Instead, the United States announced that this was the American Freedom Agenda and that the road to peace in Jerusalem ran through Baghdad. The Palestine Liberation Organization in Palestine, Hamas in the same region, the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, the Syrian Ba'ath Party, the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon, and Al-Qaeda were all considered part of the undifferentiated terror to be fought and crushed with all the military strength of the U.S. While some claim victory as our forces withdraw from Iraq, world opinion views the American experience in Iraq and the Middle East as a disastrous failure. Nearly 5,000 dead, tens of thousands gravely wounded, and trillions in wasted dollars. But the cost to the peoples of the Middle East has been far greater. The invasion and occupation of Iraq has destroyed the country, killed hundreds of thousands, and led to the biggest refugee crisis in the history of the Middle East. Most Americans are not extremely knowledgeable about most of the rest of the world. Um, the United States is an island um, with two small, much smaller, much weaker countries as its only neighbors. Um, it's always been, since the very early period in its history, immune um, to external aggression. Uh, the War of 1812 was the last time the United States was really seriously threatened until Pearl Harbor or until the advent of nuclear weapons. Um, so for 150 years of its history, nearly, uh, the, or 130 or 40 years of its history, the United States was a country that grew up in isolation from the rest of the world. And to some extent, this was self-ordained isolation. The idea was that people came to the new world to escape the ills of the old world. Um, and this led to the, the most monoglot culture in perhaps on Earth. People in the United States know fewer foreign languages than people almost anywhere else, including American elites. They are remarkably ignorant of foreign languages. Um, and that's true of ordinary people. So they are physically separated from the rest of the world. They've never been threatened until the modern era by the rest of the world. And they don't know any languages, by and large. Some, some know some, obviously. Um, so this is a background which I think provides for a very low level of general knowledge. You then have the stultifying effect of what passes for news on television, which, which I think people, makes people actually a lot more ignorant and less knowledgeable about the world by its sensationalizing and trivializing of international news and by its ignor ignoring most important issues in international news. Um, so what they know about the world is fairly limited. And I think the Arab world is sort of a black hole in an otherwise quite dismal picture uh, in that you have a great deal of stereotyping and prejudice. Um, you have um, a lot of old prejudices about Islam. You have a lot of other things very strongly reinforced by cinema, by TV and movies, uh, which portray the Arab world almost entirely in an extremely negative light. There's, I, don't, I can't think of one positive portrayal of an Arab in any movie I've ever seen. I can think of hundreds of terrorists, of evil sheikhs, of, uh, of uh, vicious, oil-hungry potentates, of autocrats, of... Uh, of uh, uh, owners of harems. I mean, you know, the, the images just flow like oil uh, in terms of cinema and television. And you can talk to any actor who plays Arabs, and basically you play Fed stand owners and you play terrorists. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the roles available to your Arab actor in today's theater, in today's cinema, in today's television. So given that background, a great deal of, of, of uh, not a great deal of knowledge about the world, um, a great deal of stereotyping, um, the fact that the Arab world is perceived in terms of uh, as the enemy by people who are supporters of Israel uh, means that you're starting with a matrix that is negative. And uh, into this is poured a great deal of strong feeling uh, of hostility to the Arab world because of people's partisanship in favor of Israel. Um, and those are people who tend to be influential. Those are people who tend to be articulate. Those are people who tend to have a great deal of influence on TV, movies, and the news, and so on and so forth. And so you have some particularly virulent 
hostility uh, to the Arab world uh, operating in a matrix of enormous ignorance. I mean, if you were to tell people in the United States, most Arabs don't live in the desert. Most Arabs live in cities. Most Arabs are literate. Most Arabs live in countries where polygamy is not practiced, or at least most Arabs don't practice polygamy. Uh, uh, that there are Christians in the Arab world, uh, that there are some countries in the Arab world that are democratic. You would shock most Americans. They have no idea about these things. If you were to say uh, a, a number of negative stereotypes, things that reflect negative stereotypes, most Americans would agree. So I think that the knowledge about the Arab world uh, in the United States is very, very low. As it turns out, the American leadership knew little about the history and peoples of the Middle East. Furthermore, what they thought they knew was, to say the least, inaccurate and distorted. The consequences will unfold over the coming generations. Both Americans and Middle Easterners will continue to pay for the misguided policies of the new millennium long after its architects are dead and buried. But what would a more sober approach to the Middle East have produced? Would results have been different if there had been a better understanding of the region and its peoples? It is best to start at the beginning of the modern Middle East in the aftermath of World War I in 1918. Between 1918 and 1920, Britain and France, the war's victorious powers, seized, occupied, and colonized the former lands of the 700-year-old Ottoman Empire. No one asked the people of the region what they desired. British and French colonial civil servants drew all the borders and arranged all the governments for the countries that emerged. All the political struggles, all the parties, and all the conflicts of the region from that time to the present have their roots in the colonial settlement of 1920. In the aftermath of the First World War, Ottoman Turkey was dismembered, and that whole empire was divided up amongst the victorious allies in a way that was extremely cynical. Of course, the colonial powers had earlier divided Africa up, the interior of the whole African continent amongst them in 1885 at, in a single conference in Berlin. So it was nothing new for the West European colonial powers to suddenly, you know, get a huge new chunk of land and divide it up amongst them. The way that it worked in the um, Eastern Mediterranean area between the Mediterranean, let's say, and Iran, which was an independent country, is that the British and the French were the two powers, and they simply drew lines on the map. Sometimes the lines were a little blurry, um, and they said, this goes to England and this goes to France. And that was it. Um, there were two guys who did it, Mark Sykes and uh, Georges Picot, and that's why the lines were called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And um, what happened is interesting because these were majority Arab areas. Um, obviously, the Turkish Empire had been ruled by Muslims who were ethnic Turks, these were ethnic Arabs, and they were given a number of different states. But um, so they had, you know, Saudi Arabia, which was largely independent anyway. Um, its independence was was ratified, if you like, as part of that whole post World War One period. Then you had Iraq was, you know, the, the borders were deline delineated, and um, it became. Iraq, Syria was delineated and became Syria, Palestine and Jordan, Lebanon of course was carved out in a special way to please the French. And those lines didn't correspond to previous national boundaries. There had been no national boundaries there before. Where was America? America was a victorious power too, but at the time not a particularly imperialistic one. American imperial designs were focused on Latin America and the Pacific. Meanwhile, Britain and France enjoyed more or less free reign to reshape the Middle East to suit their respective goals and policies, and adding more countries to their extensive empires. So what happened was that you had state administrations that were um, built there by the colonial powers in each of those emerging nations. Um, the British got Iraq, and Jordan and Palestine, the French got Syria and Lebanon, and 
they, they were given kind of control over these countries by the League of Nations, which gave them something called a mandate, because of course this was after President Wilson's 14 points, one of which was that all nations have the right to self-determination. But, you know, in their pa patronizing paternalistic way, the governments in London and Paris decided that the Arab people were not ready for independence or self-governance, and so they therefore they had to be kind of, you know, nannied along by the British and French colonial powers. Of course, oil interests were key, um, especially for the British. They needed to be able to extract oil and to be able to protect their sea lines of communication with the empire in India. So if you look at the way the boundaries were drawn, for example, there is one little portion that goes up from Jordan northwest, no, northeast, toward Iraq that exactly follows the pipeline that the British had built from Iraq that took the oil from there um, westward to the Mediterranean. And in fact, if you drive along that portion of Jordan, you pass through several little towns, kind of uh, small places in the desert, you're driving essentially along the top of the, the oil pipeline, and the towns are called H1 and H2 and H3 because those were the pumping stations that the towns grew up around. I mean, it's very blatant how it was all done just for the oil interest. And of course, you know, then you had the Suez Canal and all that, the sea lines of communication with the empire in India. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson was concerned that European nationalism and imperial competition had contributed to the outbreak of the World War and he determined to dull the edges of the imperial scramble for the Middle East. Wilson dispatched the King Crane Commission to discern the wishes and desires of the people of the Middle East. It was named after its two principal members, Henry King and Charles Crane. The commission traveled to Anatolia, Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon in 1919, speaking with hundreds of people from elites to the most humble. They concluded that the people of the region desired independence. British and French colonial governments were the two least favored options. In 1920, America was seen as a benign and non-imperialistic power by the people of the region. But when Wilson was incapacitated by a stroke, colonial lobbies in London and Paris divided the region and British and French military forces occupied the cities, towns, and villages. Na nationalism in, in, the, in the Arab world begins as a response to the intrusion of Western colonial powers. Um, it has a different nature in each country, partly because the colonial experience was different. So in Algeria, starting in the 1830s, you had one kind of colonial uh, adventure, uh, which produces a, one kind of response. Um, in other countries, you have different kinds of, of colonial uh, intrusion, uh, Egypt, for example, or, or the countries of the Arab East, so-called uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine, are taken over after World War I by the British and the French. And so there's a different process in each place. So uh, to generalize, uh, in every case, these responses uh, were uh, nationalist in the sense of people wanting not to be ruled by um, outside forces. Um, but in many cases they took a religious form, in many cases they took a secular form. In some cases they combined the two, or, they, or there, was a, there, was a, uh, there was a process of evolution and change. In Egypt, for example, there were periods in which the national movement had a religious coloration, uh, 1890s, for example, under Mustafa Kemal, the National Party. It was a secular national party, but it had a certain religious valence to it. Uh, and other part times, the period of the weft after World War I, when the national movement was explicitly, avowedly secular with Muslim and Christian leaders and almost no religious rhetoric to it. A lot of discussion of Egypt as a country that went back to the pharaohs, so to the pre-Islamic past. Um, the same is true in Algeria where you have a resistance movement that's both led by Abdel Qadir, um, which is both religious and secular. I mean, it's a nationalist response to colonial occupation, um, but it also involves elements of religion. Same is true in the response to the Italians in Libya, where you have both religious and secular elements. 
Um, and the same is true in the Sudan with the response to uh, British uh, colonialism, uh, where, where it was largely a religious movement, but it can also be seen as nationalist. Um, I guess it would be in the Eastern Arab world, in countries like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, that you had the least uh, uh, valence, the least uh, weight of religious elements in the initial reactions to uh, European imperialism after World War I. Um, <coughs> and there, the national movement was avowedly secular, and religious elements were, were, were secondary if they, if they existed at all. Um, so there were varied responses, um, with the religious element really only coming back where it, where, it had, where it had disappeared, really only coming back in the latter part of the second half of the 20th century, in other words, in the 70s, 18, 1970s and 80s, um, really was when religion began to, religious movements, political movements inspired by religion, began to complete, compete seriously with secular nationalist movements. Now, the mandates were supposed to be temporary, you know, until these nations were so-called ready for self-governance. And um, in the course of the Second World War, the French obviously had problems because you had Pétainism that worked with the Nazis in Germany. Um, and so the British supported, to some degree, the movement of the Syrians and the, uh, and the Lebanese for independence from France in those days until, of course, de Gaulle came back and um, was, you know, a big buddy of the British and the French and the, and the Western allies in the Second World War. But what had happened in that whole period, you had a sort of um, the birth of some kind of identification of people with being Syrian or with being Lebanese or with being Jordanian, but it was, it was very fragile and infant in the pre-Second World War period because, you know, people still thought of themselves primarily as, as Muslims, primarily as Arabs. There was, you know, a lot of pan-Islamic and pan-Arab feeling in those days or else they would feel identification with, you know, the local big town. It might be Nablus, it might be Aleppo, it might be Damascus. But they didn't necessarily think of themselves as, you know, a citizen of Syria or a citizen of Iraq or whatever. Um, the, the partition of this region that, that is, that is uh, sketched out in the Sykes-Picot agreements of 1915 and 1916 um, is the basis for the governments and sta the states and nations and governments of countries like Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel-Palestine. Um, all of these states were carved out of uh, a group of provinces that were part of the Ottoman Empire by European powers that were acting entirely in their own self-interest on the basis of rivalry between them, Britain and France, uh, which, and, 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 and that created frontiers that reflected in almost no cases the actual um, wishes of the people involved. Um, so you have these long straight lines running across the desert between what is today Saudi Arabia and what is today Jordan or between Saudi Arabia and Iraq or between Syria and Jordan or whatever. And they're just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of straight lines. Well, what's on one side, what's on the other side? That didn't concern. Um, Sykes and Picot and the other British and French uh, diplomats and strategists who drew up these lines. Um, so the first thing is that these are in some measure artificial states. They may have been a state of Lebanon or Iraq, might have developed in a different way, but as they are, as they are today in terms of the frontiers that were established by these partitions and later deals between European powers, they're artificial states. Um, the second impact of this was, so, so the creation of the states is the first, the second impact of this was to create a sense of grievance among peoples who probably would have organized their political life somewhat differently uh, had they been given a chance to do that. And so Sykes-Picot and the partitions imposed by the European powers as a result of those agreements have been uh, since the 1920s, since they were ca pretty much carried out, um, a, a, a source of deep uh, anger and, 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 and uh, 
a sense of, of, of grievance that, that, you know, has diminished over time because these nation states have taken on a reality of their own. They are all now real nation states. Um, uh, but there is still a sense of grievance that, you know, what might have been a more cohesive whole might or might not have, but the, the imagination of people is that it might have, um, uh, was divided up by these imperialist uh, uh, map makers. Britain and France divided the region between them. Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, Egypt, the states of the Persian Gulf, and Istanbul went to Britain, which was the stronger power. British politicians like Winston Churchill sought to monopolize actual and potential oil resources and dominate the lines of communication between the Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf, and India. Churchill wanted Egypt's Suez Canal and the corridor from coastal Palestine through Jordan and Iraq to the oil fields of the Gulf and Iran. Most of the oil was already under British concession with a company that would come to be called British Petroleum, or BP. Winston Churchill had himself purchased controlling interest to make the British government the majority shareholder of BP. British control of Istanbul limited Russian access to the Mediterranean through the Straits. France received the scraps left in compensation for the destruction of the war fought on the Western Front. Syria, including the coastal region that came to be Lebanon, would be the French mandate. There was no oil, but France had become a military power on the northern, southern, and eastern shores. Sections of Anatolia, today's Turkey, were set aside for Italy, Greece, Britain, and France. News of the partitions met with immediate opposition and eventual armed revolt by all the peoples of the region. The Turkish Republic emerged independent when Mustafa Kemal rallied former Ottoman military forces to fight against the partition. First France, then Greece and Britain, decided to leave Turkey rather than fight another war. The British public would not stand to have the young men who survived the Great War again drafted to fight in distant colonies. Also in 1920, revolt broke out in Iraq as the population rose to expel the British forces from the new colony. Winston Churchill himself engineered the counterinsurgency offensive using the new labor-saving technologies of air power and poison gas. Egypt, Syria, and Palestine were also embroiled in armed revolt, which were suppressed at appalling human and financial cost. From the very beginning of the Zionist enterprise, which sought to recreate or create a Jewish nation state in Palestine, uh, there was a certain degree of knowledge of what uh, this movement was trying to do. And understandably, people felt that their country was about to be taken over by outsiders, by Europeans. Um, and so there was resistance. Uh, there was resistance on an intellectual level, on a political level, among people who were literate and were able to see in their papers what the Baal Congress and what, the, what various uh, uh, Zionist Congresses said, what, uh, what uh, European newspapers reported Zionist leaders as saying. And it was very clear what they intended to do. They intended to replace an Arab population with a Jewish population and, re and turn an Arab country into a Jewish country in the long term, as soon as they could do that. In the interim, they said other things to the Arabs, they said other things to others, but uh, uh, there's an unmediated transmission from the German uh, of what was being said in Europe in the pre-World War I period through the Arabic press to people who could read. So that was the political level. There was a clear consciousness that this was a political movement intended to replace the indigenous population with a foreign European settler population, people who were becoming to recreate or create a Jewish state in Palestine on the basis of this national movement that had developed among Eastern European Jews. Um, at another level, there was resistance to the process of dispossession of the peasantry, because what the Zionist movement was trying to do was not to come in like a classical uh, colonial movement and exploit the native population. They were coming in to replace the native population, not, in other words, to take over the land and take the surplus that would be created by peasant, Arab peasant cultivators, but rather to replace these cultivators with Jewish cultivators. Uh, as a result, there was a kind of friction um, from an early stage with people who were dis dispossessed 
from the very few colonies that were established. There were only a few dozen by World War I. But there was a clear a history of tension around these first settler colonies um, between the population, uh, the indigenous native population, which in many cases had land rights that were being ignored as, pri as, as modern pro private property relations were established by the Ottoman state. Uh, 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 cultivators who had uh, uh, indefinite and, and permanent right of usufruct under the old system were being told, you don't own the land, the owner has sold it, get off. And so there was a great deal of unrest as a result of this. And this, this increases through the 20s and 30s. And it fuels various Palestinian revolts and, and riots and uprisings against the British who come in in World War II and against the Zionist movement. Um, and this is the beginning of a Palestinian reaction to Zionism, which has nothing to do with anti-Semitism or even really political anti-Zionism, as one Palestinian wrote. I mean, this is a perfectly fine movement. What the problem is you're doing it here. The problem is you want to take as your country, our country. This reaction was not just a reaction of peasants to being dispossessed. It was also a reaction of people who were increasingly conscious of the actual aims of the Zionist movement, which were to replace the Arabs with Jews and replace a, an Arab society with a Jewish society. In Palestine, the revolts continued into the late 1930s until the British government resolved to abandon its troublesome commitment to Zionism and finally the mandate over Palestine itself. Independence only came to the region when the colonial powers, exhausted and bankrupt by the cost of another European world war, were forced to leave the region in the 1940s. By that time, the Zionist movement, originally under British sponsorship, had managed to subdue and colonize Palestine and eventually expel most of the indigenous inhabitants. Also by the 1940s, armed opposition to foreign intervention and colonialism had been fully established. The desire for true independence and opposition to intervention, colonialism, and imperialism remain potent among the people of the region till today. Next time, we will explore how the search for independence, justice, and dignity animated politics in the 1950s and 60s.